Uh, we're so glad to see you here tonight. And Heather, I'm wondering if we gave you um, permission to share. Are you able to share your screen? We didn't uh, check that. We were, yep. we were so... Oh, good. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. It's so good to see you here this evening. Um, we have with us this evening Heather White as our guest speaker. But before we get to her exciting news, I want to recognize some of our faculty members here this evening. Um, and our university president, Dr. Levins, is here uh, joining us. It's the middle of the night where you are, right, Mike? All yes, the way is. from yep. across Midnight the pond. In Oxford here. Yeah. Welcome. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, Mike, would you like to do the honors of announcing our big news? Yeah, gl glad to. Yeah, so we just received a notification today. And again, welcome everyone to the colloquia. Um, Sarasota University is proud to announce we are able to recruit nationally uh, for our uh, for all of our uh, programs. And so uh, very excited to do that. And it's going to be, this is a really great opportunity for Sarasota to expand our reach, um, expand partnerships, just serve the community as we really wish to do. So again, uh, we're really pleased with that. Uh, we'll share more more news, look for, for emails from us, more information. Uh, and uh, we look to, to really start growing the institution. Thank you so much. It is such exciting news. And um, please broadcast the news to everyone you know. Uh, we do have our bachelor's completion program up and running, as well as our master's programs in Montessori education and Montessori leadership. I want to thank uh, Dr. Lorenz for being here tonight, one of our faculty members, and Dr. Forrest as well. Thank you both for being here and representing our faculty tonight, as well as our guest speaker, Heather White. And we also have our admissions coordinator, Ellen Lastinger. Many of you know Ellen uh, from the Center for Guided Montessori Studies as well. And I'm also delighted to announce that we now have a dual enrollment option for those of you who are pursuing your Montessori credential and uh, may be interested in earning a degree at the same time. So this applies to our bachelor's completion program students, as well as our master's of arts uh, students as well. And I may as well mention that uh, Dr. Lorenz and I have already been talking about the exciting plans for the doctoral program that we hope to be launching next summer. So lots of great things happening at Sarasota University. Much thanks to all of our talented professors and staff uh, for making that happen. And so now the real reason why we're all here this evening is to hear from our esteemed Heather White, who's also on faculty here at Sarasota University. And Heather, I'll turn it over to you at this time. Thank you. I am very excited with all of that uh, news and hope to be one of the first enrolled in the doctoral program. So fingers crossed that that happens yes. next year. I'm gonna share my screen here and we'll get started. Fantastic. All right, it's showing me it's up. Can everybody see that? Yes. Perfect. Well, I'm so honored uh, to have been uh, chosen as a presenter for this month's Sarasota University Colloquium. And I'm excited to have all of you here. Um, and if you're watching the replay, I'm honored that you took the time to do so as well. Before we jump in, I wanted to share just a few details that define me as the host for tonight and the creator of the presentation. So like Lindsay said, my name is Heather White. Um, I have been a Montessori classroom teacher, administrator, and, and home caregiver uh, for more than 15 years now in the world of Montessori. And currently I wear lots of many different hats. Um, I'm an educational coach. I work in multiple roles with the uh, Center for Guided Montessori Studies, including as their alumni conference and webinar coordinator. 
and also as an instructional guide, practicum advisor, and field consultant for adult learners who are working to receive their Montessori credential. And as Lindsay said, it is my honor to also be a faculty member for Sarasota University. Um, above and beyond that, as if maybe that wasn't enough, I also uh, do some work as a blog writer and content creator for a couple of different Montessori organizations, including uh, the American Montessori Society. I have uh, certifications from AMS at the three to six and six to nine age levels, and also have experience working with zero to three and nine to 12 as well. I have a master's degree in education with a concentration in Montessori studies and an education specialist degree in school psychology. I'm also a nationally certified school psychologist. <clears throat> So now that we have all that business out of the way and you know who I am and what brings me to you, uh, let's take a look at what we're going to discuss tonight. So during the session, uh, we'll cover a range of topics, starting with the benefits of uh, learning about and connecting with nature. And then we'll explore how Montessori schools foster those connections through the use of things like outdoor classrooms, natural play spaces, going out experiences, and also ways to bring nature into the classroom itself. Uh, we'll have time for questions and comments at the end, but if something comes up for you throughout the presentation, please feel free to um, add your questions in the chat or use the raise hand feature. I'm more than happy to kind of pause and address questions and comments uh, as they kind of come to you. I think that's really uh, an organic way to make sure that everybody's participating and understanding. So please feel free to do that. As Lindsay knows, um, my favorite way to start and close uh, most of my presentations is with some inspiration, a quote. Um, and one of the main pillars of the Montessori philosophy is this really deep connection with the natural world. So to showcase this, I wanted to start with a quote from Maria Montessori herself about the importance of providing children this contact with nature. In her book, The Secret of Childhood, Maria Montessori advised, there must be provision for the child to have contact with nature, to understand and appreciate the order, the harmony, and the beauty in nature, so that the child may better understand and participate in the marvelous things which civilization creates. So that's kind of our inspiration and our grounding for our conversation tonight about providing that deep, rich, meaningful contact with nature for children. I wanted to take just a few moments now, um, again, to kind of ground us and get us into the mindset um, of thinking about ways to connect with nature, ways that we connect with nature so that we can think about ways to do that with children as well. So I wanted to start with a little visualization activity. So I'd like for you all to close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so. And to think about a childhood memory that you have of playing outdoors, I want you to try to really allow yourself to drop into this memory and bring up as much detail with the memory as possible, paying attention to all of your different senses. I want you to think about what you see, what you hear, what you smell. Maybe think about what you feel, who else is with you. Maybe you think about what the weather's like. And if you can't bring up a childhood memory, maybe try to think of a more recent memory of a time that you spent in nature. And when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes and come back with us. I wanted to share um, some photos of me and some of my favorite childhood memories. Um, and so this is kind of my inspiration for our conversation tonight. Um, I didn't get permission, so hopefully they're okay with this. But on the right side, you see a picture of uh, my cousin, who was like one of my siblings growing up. We were very close in age. Um, and a fun fact, that swing set, swing set still exists in my aunt's backyard. And on holidays, when the family comes back together, we all 
uh, go back out and, and play on it again, even as adults and with our children, their children. Um, and then on the left, uh, one of my favorite memories was driving around in my Barbie Jeep outside. Um, so these are some of the memories that I have that I'm connecting to and keeping in the back of my mind. And I'd like you to do the same. Um, think about what being outdoors means to you. Think about how rich those experiences were, whether you were building a sandcastle at the beach, blowing a dandelion, or maybe walking through the woods and picking up different leaves in the fall of different colors. Maybe you were riding your bike through the neighborhood or a specific playground that you remember. Um, so use that as kind of the foundation for the work that we're going to do tonight and think about how we can create those same meaningful, rich experiences that we were given with the children that we have uh, the pleasure and the honor of working with. Or if you're in uh, a leadership role or in an instructional role, how we can help inspire and motivate guides who work with children to do that important work as well. So we're going to hear a lot about Maria Montessori's perspective on the topic of connecting children with nature. But before we do that, I wanted to hear from you all of why you believe it's important for children to connect with nature. So I invite you to, um, in the chat, share just a few of your thoughts. We'll just pause for just a, a few moments here and just share, maybe it's one word, maybe it's a sentence of why you believe it's important and powerful for children to connect with nature. Nurture wonder, create that sense of awe and curiosity. Yeah, we, I was actually just um, teaching a live course for Sarasota University, and we were talking about that, that inspiring, that sense of awe and wonder um, and, and being a leader. I see the fact nature nurtures, yes. It's important for children to connect with nature because of the value that nature holds to holistic learning and discovery. Freedom and unstructured play, reset and just breathe. I love that. Hopefully that's what that memory portion uh, provided you just a moment ago. And it looks like we had one more come in. Taking time to drink in the outside. Yeah, really relishing in those moments, right? Balancing and appreciating the environment. Nature is real and has everything we need. Yeah, we talk about providing realistic experiences and uh, manipulatives for children whenever possible, right? Connecting them to things that are real in the world. So from Maria Montessori's perspective, um, in her book, From Childhood to Adolescence, she really urged this need for connecting children with nature. And she stated, there is no description, no image in any book that is capable of replacing the sight of real trees and all the life to be found around them in a real forest. Something emanates from those trees which speaks to the soul, something no book, no museum is capable of giving. So I think that that's a lot of what you all were just saying, right? It provides this uh, sense of awe and wonder. It nurtures. We are able to kind of pause and, and just be for a moment. Um, and it gives children that real experience that they, they need and that they crave. And so now that we have this foundational understanding, uh, right before we dive into the uh, heavy content for tonight's presentation, I would love for you all to share in the chat as well what you believe the benefits of incorporating this connection to nature or this outdoor learning in the classroom or in a school environment might be. So we know that it provides this grounding and this nurturing and so how is that helpful or how is that beneficial in a school or classroom setting? I think some of the, the uh, answers I was just looking back through them kind of overlap, right? It, it creates a sense of balance. Um, and it, it gives the children a, a chance to reset and breathe. That's equally as important, creating that 
peaceful environment, um, as we talked about pre bringing real things into the classroom or exposing them to real things. I see hands-on interactions, yep, uh, that aids the child in understanding that education is everywhere. Yeah, it's beyond the classroom. Our entire world, um, like Dr. Lorenz said, is a learning environment. They provide concrete applications, hands-on and re releases anxiety. Having children connect with the environment and appreciate it so that they value it and want to protect it for the future. We're going to get into some of that, that idea of global citizenship that Maria Montessori spoke of. Children experience physical benefits from being in nature, such as walking on uneven ground, developing a sense of balance. Absolutely. And finally, helps movement with fresh air. Again, we can connect the lessons to nature, parts of a tree, flowers, sea creatures, the list goes on. Absolutely. Montessori is beautiful in the sense that we incorporate a lot of these, uh, what we call cosmic or cultural lessons, and it provides this really natural opportunity uh, to connect with the natural world. So Maria Montessori, as we have covered already, placed this great importance, this really large emphasis on a child's experiences with nature, stating that the best way of invigorating a child is to immerse him in nature. These are some of the main benefits of doing so. Uh, first, nature helps to really drive the forces of curiosity and exploration in children. It's that sense of awe and wonder we talked about, right? The natural world is full of mysteries and discoveries just waiting to be made from things like the life cycle of insects to the changing seasons, and it's this endless variety that really captivates a child's imagination and encourages them to ask questions, to seek answers, and to engage in that hands-on learning that we were talking about as well. By exploring natural environments, children learn how to carefully observe, how to think there. critically, how to uh, understand too, but... different inter interconnections and ecosystems. And it's this innate curiosity that really fosters a lifelong love of learning and a really deep appreciation for the world that we live in, which lays that foundation for um, environmental stewardship or global citizenship. Those were uh, two terms that Dr. Maria Montessori herself used. Nature also provides really rich sensorial experiences that are unmatched. So from the rustling of leaves in the wind to vibrant colors of a blooming flower, nature really has this powerful way of stimulating all of our senses uh, in a way that other environments aren't able to replicate. Whether it's the sounds of birds chirping or maybe the scent of a fresh pine tree, um, maybe the texture of moss under your feet, um, all of these things are so sensory rich and really immerse us in the world around us. And that creates this really deep connection with the world. Um, as we talked about, this en enrichment and immersion can reduce stress, enhance mood, and provide a sense of mental clarity and focus that is difficult to find elsewhere. And that brings us to the third benefit of outdoor learning, uh, which some of you touched on as well, which is that spending time in nature promotes uh, de development in multiple areas for children, physical, social, emotional, cognitive. Uh, physically, outdoor play encourages children to be more active. It fosters healthy growth and motor skill development. And in fact, as you were mentioning in the chat, I believe it might have been Holly, uh, Dr. Forrest, just by stepping outside, um, by stepping on uneven ground, children are developing gross motor skills and balance and coordination. Um, their visual acuity and depth perception improves just as they begin kind of looking around and seeing farther away. Socially, playing in nature uh, often involves cooperative play, right? And that this helps children to develop communication and teamwork. And emotionally, nature provides this calming backdrop where children are able to start to learn how to regulate their emotions, reduce their anxiety, um, and engage in social interactions and connections that are replenishing and rejuvenating. And that, I think, is what really creates that uh, intellectual growth because it allows them to connect with one another and to the earth through these rich sensorial experiences. And that promotes that love of learning and also the connection to the natural world, that uh, desire to be an environmental steward. 
Forming a connection with nature also helps children become more environmentally responsible. And that viewpoint of um, environmental stewardship then extends into adulthood. Learning outside also supports creativity and problem solving. Uh, being outside presents these diverse dynamic settings that really challenge children to think creatively and to adapt to new situations. Nature encourages more imaginative play where children can invent different games and thinking. Um, and also it presents real world problems like how to navigate a trail or how to build a shelter, um, which really en encourages these practical problem solving skills that children will also carry with them into adulthood. Um, we're gonna skip over here. We talked a little bit already about reducing anxious energy and promoting focus. The last thing I just wanted to focus on is that spending time in the natural world um, might not be considered uh, a main benefit of academic learning, right? But the experience of preparing just to go outside. So let me let me pause and, and kind of step back. I, I stumbled over my words there. So although it's not the experience itself of going outside, preparing to do so, right? And what I mean by that are things like putting on a coat, putting on our shoes, um, if you're in uh, an area that's raining, maybe you need a rain jacket. If you're in an area, um, Lindsay and I were just talking like Minnesota in the winter, you probably need uh, a uh, really thick coat and gloves and a hat. I can't even imagine being in Florida, what that feels like and getting children prepared for that. Um, but all of that, right, helps children develop really valuable skills as well. Um, they're learning patience as they wait their turn how to, um, as they're learning how to do things like buckling, zipping, buttoning. Um, and for a really young child, these skills are equally as important to all of the learning that happens once they step outside of those classroom doors and into the natural world. Maria Montessori was so convinced of the power of the natural learning environment that she advocated that children have what she called unfettered access to the outdoors. In her ideal world, she saw no separation between an indoor and an outdoor classroom. And so it's important that we try to think of the natural environment not as a separate entity from the physical classroom, but instead as an extension of the structured indoor environment. Uh, in, the indoor, in the outdoor environment that you see pictured here from Guadalupe Montessori, you can see that it looks very similar to how an indoor classroom might be set up, right? Um, you see the shelves there with some traditional Montessori materials. I see some botany and zoology puzzles. Um, it looks like maybe towards the back there against the, the wall of the tent might be a sensorial material. Um, and so essentially it's the same as the indoor classroom kind of transported to the outdoor environment. And particularly for younger students in the toddler or early childhood levels, and these spaces uh, typically include a lot of what we would refer to as wet uh, practical life activities. Things like pouring with water, right? Pouring using a funnel, using a sponge, dishwashing. Um, some people even have a clothesline and have uh, washing clothes and hanging clothes out to dry. I see a, a note in chat here. Uh, Dr. Loren said, I worked with Ottawa Montessori Consulting once upon a time, and it took longer in January to dress to go outside than to actually be outside. Yeah. But like I said, living in Florida, that's a little hard to imagine. Sometimes we need an umbrella, but that's really about it. <laughs> I wanted to share a few uh, other photos because I think they're just absolutely beautiful and inspirational outdoor Montessori classrooms. And these are from uh, Trillium Montessori. In the first photo, you can see those black double doors on the left-hand side go into the indoor learning environment. And they're opened, right? Creating this really seamless connection between the inside and the outside. And there are tables for children to work at and activities that are more conducive to outdoor spaces. Things like we were just talking about, clothes washing, hanging clothes on a line, painting. And some other popular activities might be things like watering plants, gardening, uh, filling and cleaning bird feeders, sweeping the sidewalk, maybe scrubbing the fence that you see in some of the photos there, or washing 
the windows on or uh, the glass that's on those doors, all of those are really great experiences that you can introduce that are more conducive to an outdoor setting um, so that when spills happen, as they will, it's a little easier to clean up. This is another view uh, on the left-hand side of a really beautiful uh, outdoor space that was on Trillium Montessori's website from Lauren Marquis's classroom. And then on the right-hand side here, you can see another outdoor environment from Green Spring Montessori School. And there you see older children um, with some younger children doing yoga, gardening, and engaging in creative play. But what I wanna emphasize is that the outdoor environment doesn't have to be so elaborate. Even if you just have a few rows of desks or tables or students are sitting in the grass and just take a notebook outside, um, if they're an elementary student, um, they're likely to be more productive, more attentive, calmer, happier, just by physically being in the natural world. So it really can be as simple as just stepping outside and continuing the same work that you are doing inside, even if that's not with traditional materials or lessons. The next focus here is on creating natural play spaces. So these are play environments or playgrounds um, that include elements and textures from the earth, things like uh, tree logs, tree stumps, boulders, plants, drainage paths, or little uh, creeks, if you will, where water runs, among others, instead of what we might consider a more traditional steel playground um, that has slides and climbers, um, basically, if you've ever climbed a rock, played in the leaves, planted something in a garden, you understand what natural play is. These natural landscapes really lend themselves uh, very naturally to that kind of learning. It's these opportunities for children to play, explore, imagine, and just be really challenged by the elements that occur around them in the natural world. They enable children to move really freely around the environment. So it's encouraging them to engage in more gross motor skills like running, jumping, climbing, crawling. And studies show that children spend even more time playing outdoors in these natural play spaces than they do on traditional playground environments. And they think that's because um, being made from natural elements, they have these significant benefits. So if we believe um, and really listen to what Maria Montessori said that children instinctively know what their minds and bodies need to learn and grow. Um, that's why they would be more drawn to these setups. And it they provides them the opportunity not just to engage in this creative play, um, but also increase, just like we were talking about before, right? It increases their mental health. It encourages socialization. It promotes uh, inclusivity, right? It, it provides opportunities for more children to be included. Children can be challenged through this physical play things by things like boulders or tree stumps um, to promote their physical st skills, strength, and balance. Things like rocks and plants and animal feeders encourage children to collaborate and to um, problem solve with one another. And that creates this sense of empathy and connection and working together. And since most natural playscapes are open, like I was saying, that really uh, lends itself naturally to being more inclusive, to um, allowing children of different skill levels and abilities to really be involved. Thank you, Dr. Lorenz, for providing some resources there in the chat. Here are a few uh, other photos for inspiration of what a natural play space might look like. This one is from the Montessori Academy of London and was created by a company called Earthscape. So you can see there's not what you would consider a, a typical of a playground space, right? There's a lot of open field for grass. You see leaves, you see trees, you see these boulders that children are climbing on. Uh, the children in the back are sitting on a large, um, it looks like a, a stump. And this is another photo from Green Spring Montessori. Um, I particularly was drawn to this one. I thought it was really neat. You can see children uh, in the background, right? Climbing on these large tree stumps. You can see that they have a greenhouse, but then what drew me in was this photo here uh, in the front of the girls who have kind of created their own human bird nest, if you will. Yes, oh, I love that. 
the creativity is oh, amazing, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So a staple of Montessori classrooms uh, is are going out experiences. And these are structured excursions that take the learning beyond the traditional classroom and provide children with opportunities to explore and engage with the real world. They're designed to be really purposeful and meaningful, giving children opportunities for hands-on learning and the application of what they have gained in the classroom, the knowledge that they've gained in the classroom in more practical settings. Maria Montessori uh, talked about these going out experiences as a way to emphasize independence, to spark curiosity, to engage that sense of awe and wonder, and to provide children experiential learning opportunities. So typically these going out experiences might involve uh, visits to places like the museum or a botanical gardens, maybe a farm, a cultural site. Um, and during these trips, children take on really active roles, especially if they're an elementary student or an adolescent, they're the one who is planning and executing the outing, including researching the destination, organizing transportation, setting objectives for what they'll do or what they hope to learn while they're on their visit. The practical life skills, as you can imagine, um, are really well suited for that elementary age child because it gives them the opportunity to learn skills, uh, things like how to make a phone call, how to leave a message, how to read a map, how to read a bus route maybe, planning what items you need to take on a trip, and also finding out any other important information that they might need to make the trip successful. So when we think about practical life, uh, the early childhood level and the, the infant toddler level, it might be something that's on a shelf, right? A shelf work like pouring, scooping, but at the elementary and adolescent level, it really is about providing these experiences where the child's learning practical skills that they'll then use in their daily life as adults moving forward. And that's what gives them this sense of responsibility and autonomy. And children are really able to take ownership of their educational journey. So through these going out experiences, they have more buy-in for what they're doing back in the classroom because they're invigorated um, and really excited to learn more once they come back into the classroom as well. So whether it's visiting a wildlife preserve, maybe a national or state park, maybe even a local waterway, right? Like a river or a stream or a pond. Even these types of experiences are really beneficial for children. It doesn't have to be uh, somewhere that you pay to go, right? A museum or a botanical garden. It can be somewhere that's right in your backyard. Even if you're in a very urban setting, maybe it's just finding uh, the local uh, strip that has right a single piece of grass and just stepping back and letting the children observe or stepping outside and just seeing what li wildlife you see. Maybe it's a bug or a bird, um, but offering these really crucial moments for elementary children to plan these experiences and then have them and bring this holistic and immersive learning back into the classroom as well. I want to make sure that everyone knows that as wonderful as that sounds, it might not always be possible, right? There, there are barriers that sometimes pre prevents those elaborate opportunities for going out experiences, especially with really young children. But there are still other ways that you can get children outside and help them explore the natural world. It can be as simple as going on a nature walk, like I was just saying, but letting the child be the guide. So pause when they want to watch a trail of ants cross the sidewalk or if they wanna feel the bark on the tree. Um, you can even encourage them to bring along a notebook and pause to allow them to write down their thoughts or their questions. Maybe you bring a sketch pad and, and allow them to pause and draw what it is that they see around them. Collecting really natural artifacts like pine cones, acorns, leaves, rocks is also a really great way uh, to incorporate the child, young child's desire and fascination with tiny objects that you can then bring back into the classroom to continue learning and to promote that sense of connection to the natural world. You might even focus on environmental responsibility while you're on a, a walk outside with a child and become what we said Maria Montessori described as the global citizen or environmental steward by picking up trash or debris, right? It can just be something as simple as that 
that really helps children understand the power that they have and the connection to the world around them. As it says here, gardening is also another really great way to get children connected to uh, the land. And it's a great hands-on activity that provides a lot of fine motor skills and coordination. It also fosters that same sense of patience we were talking about with getting dressed to go outside um, and encourages healthy eating habits. Ideally, uh, if possible, we would focus on growing edible organic plants so that children are able to experience that full cycle from planting a seed to preparing their own snack or meal for themselves or the class. Um, in the past, when I was in the classroom, one of my favorite things was the ch watching the children grow things like lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, strawberries, and then they were able to harvest them and they made a huge salad uh, for the entire school community. And they went around to each classroom and offered it uh, to the other classrooms for them to enjoy. And it was just so beautiful. And you could really see the pride uh, that they had in their work, how connected they were to it, how empowering it was but also to see them eating foods that for some of them, they didn't usually eat um, was really amazing as well. Melina Gaff Levin uh, had a recent webinar that I thought was really incredible. It was entitled Developing a Practice of Outdoor Learning with a Montessori Toddler Class. And she talked about bringing nature into the classroom and how it's a really wonderful way uh, to provide these learning opportunities for children from families who might not be as comfortable or as enthusiastic about outdoor play. She provided a really powerful reminder that there are a variety of factors like personal experiences, cultural beliefs, environmental conditions even, that might shape a family's attitude about outdoor activities and that some of them might be a little more hesitant about them. So whether that's limited exposure, right, to outdoor environments, like living in an urban environment, maybe it's a lack of access to green spaces, cultural practices that promote and prioritize indoor spaces and activities, even adverse experiences related to natural disasters or environmental hazards or even personal traumas might cause this apprehension or fear surrounding outdoor play. And furthermore, she talks about how cultural beliefs and traditions might impact a family's perception about outdoor activities. For instance, uh, some cultures might really emphasize cleanliness, and that might lead to concerns about children getting dirty or being exposed to really natural elements. Similarly, there are some cultural taboos or superstitions related to different weather conditions or specific outdoor settings, and that might deter families or, or parents and caregivers from wanting their children to engage in outdoor play and really embracing its values. She also notes the uh, impact of socioeconomic factors, right, and how this plays a really significant role in shaping families' experiences with outdoor activities. Families who face economic challenges might like lack access to appropriate clothing, and so this might make it difficult for children to engage especially in extreme weather conditions. You know, we were talking about how, how many layers of clothing it might take if you were in a really cold space. And if children um, come from a, a lower socioeconomic background, they might not have all of that uh, available to them. So as educators, it's really important that we try to approach these differences with a lot of sensitivity and empathy and cultural competence. We can try to provide resources and information that highlight a lot of the benefits of outdoor play so that they start to warm up to the idea, right? And, and start to learn about it, but also to address some common concerns. Maybe we provide practical tips for how to dress appropriately or how to manage a safety concern, um, creating this really open dialogue with families where we hear their concerns and we continue to educate and maybe provide gradual exposure to these experiences as well. And even in situations where maybe that's impossible or your families um, are just not ready for their children to engage in these outdoor experiences, right? There are ways that you can bring nature into the classroom and still allow some of the same benefits. Although this photo itself isn't outside, I think this is a great example of how you might be able to bring natural elements from outside into the classroom. So bringing things like pebbles, sticks, pine cones, 
um, can be great not only for investigation and exploration, but also for academic exercises as well. So this particular work would help a children uh, help a child with their understanding of numeracy, right? It's very reminiscent of cards and counters, if you're familiar with the Montessori work. Um, but instead, the child's using sticks and pine cones. Um, for those of you who uh, are familiar with other Montessori materials, you could create something similar with sticks uh, for the spindle boxes, right? Where the child is grouping together a box, uh, a grouping of sticks, and they're able to feel the number increasing uh, from zero to 10. You could also just set up a small basket with natural materials like these. Um, and it could be things that are specific to your region. So if you live next to the beach, maybe it's seashells and sea glass and driftwood. And just allow children to take these items to their workspaces and, and enjoy them. Let them touch them, smell them. Maybe they use a magnifying glass to look at them. Um, put them up to their ear and hear them. Children love to hear a, a seashell, right? Um, maybe you bring in flowers that children can match, identify various parts seeds you can dissect, leaves to identify. Um, the options are truly limitless, right? And it's important to note as well that by just having classroom pets and classroom plants, that you are incorporating nature, right? Children are getting those opportunities to connect with nature and to learn that other life forms depend on them and vice versa for survival, reinforcing that idea of global citizenship and environmental stewardship that we mentioned before. So uh, true to my nature, as Dr. Pollock knows, I wanted to close with a final quote, a word of advice here from Maria Montessori about the importance of connecting children with nature. So she once said, let the children be free, encourage them, let them run outside when it is raining, let them remove their shoes when they find a puddle of water. And when the grass of the meadows is damp with dew, let them run on it and trample it with their bare feet. Let them rest peacefully when a tree invites them to sleep beneath its shade. Let them shout and laugh when the sun wakes them in the morning as it wakes every living creature that divides its day between waking and sleeping. Because as she said in her book, The Discovery of the Child, when children come into contact with nature, they reveal their true strength. If you are interested in learning more about um, connecting children with nature, getting back to nature, I have a variety of resources here. Um, some really wonderful books on this topic. There's uh, The Last Child in the Woods, which is uh, about what uh, Richard Liu talks about as nature deficit disorder and how that might cause some health and behavioral challenges for children uh, if they're disconnected from nature. Balanced and Barefoot talks about the developmental benefits of outdoor activities and provides some really practical advice for how to engage and encourage more free play and natural exploration. The third here is there's no such thing as bad weather, which talks about how we can uh, prepare to take children outside in all types of weather and that it's really uh, something that we have to overcome as the adults because there's such a great benefit for children. A couple more here for you. I just kept finding them and I love to share resources. So um, these are resources about how to create outdoor classrooms specifically. So there's uh, a couple there for ages three to seven. Um, forest Guide, I know Forest Schools and, and Montessori are really popular right now. Um, and then the last one there about the outdoor classroom in general. And then I just wanted to, to add um, that I recently attended a fantastic uh, webinar. I guess it was a series from Trillia Montessori. It was uh, Montessori and Ecological Consciousness. And it was just chock full of incredible information a wealth of knowledge from so many presenters. Um, so I highly recommend that as well if you're looking for some more information. This is my contact information. If you have any uh, questions or need anything after today's uh, time together, I would love for you all to reach out. And I also have my social media platforms there. If you wanna follow along, I share a lot of Montessori and education related content. 
and I will open it up to questions now. I would love to hear from you all. Heather, this has just been so informative and inspirational. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you presenting all of this information to us this evening. I, um, at Garden Oaks, where I was the principal, we, um, the parents and faculty did a book study on Richard Louv's Last Child in the Woods. And it was very powerful and uh, really helped our parents understand the importance of um, recess for one, um, and the time that we spent outside and things that they could do at home to support their children's development. Uh, so, it, you know, I would suggest that, you know, maybe folks consider doing a book study with their parents. And actually that book, if I'm not mistaken, was also translated into Spanish, which made it accessible for our parent population. So finding uh, books about that we could share in English and Spanish was also really important to us. And it's available on audio, audio book as well. Hey, uh, we Did anyone? Oh, oh, sorry. Go sorry, ahead, I Heather. I was just going to say we dove into that topic. We didn't do a book study, but as a staff, we dove into that topic. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned sharing it with parents because a question that came up for us quite a bit was homework, right? And we were a no right. homework school. And right. so being able to um, share ideas with parents of how they can extend, could extend the learning happening in the classroom and really organic ways. Um, even if like we were just talking about in the presentation, right? Even if it's just going for a walk together with your child at the end of the day and, right. and letting them observe things that are happening in the natural world um, and things that parents don't often think of as being really right. beneficial to their child's growth and development. We found, um, you know, the, the, our district policy, I was at a public uh, pre-K through eighth grade campus and our district generally discouraged um, outdoor time or recess uh, for middle school students. Uh, and so we were able to demonstrate how important it was for our students to have outdoor time. And we incorporated that into our science block to ensure that our kids, our middle schoolers were outside and connecting to nature. And we saw such a calming effect um, for our students and, and lowered anxiety. And uh, every so often there were high stakes testing and, you know, there were some administrators at the district level who thought um, it would be better to stay inside and prep for the test. But we uh, were adamant about the fact that our kids needed to be outside uh, even more so during those times when there were there were high periods of stress mm -hmm. for uh, guides and students, um, that that connection to nature really helped. That ability to move their bodies, right? But then also what we have, a lot of you brought up in the very beginning of our conversation, it's just this calming, grounding uh, feeling that being outside in, in nature provides. Right. Heather, we have a couple of comments. Uh, Dr. Lorenz included a resource, a link for outdoor discovery. Dr. Summers included a book that I'm not familiar with, but it looks really good. Um, 2023 publication date. Thank you, Dr. Lorenz and Dr. Summers. Um, Awe, the new science of everyday wonder and how it can transform your life. We all need more awe in our lives, right? Awe and wonder. And Carol in, uh, commented that they love doing art activities with natural materials in the toddler classroom. And really, you can do that with all ages. Mm -hmm. uh, art activities um, with natural materials at all ages. Um, and Dr. Summers also added... The anxious generation gives plenty of research about needing more play. So true. If you the haven't had a chance to read an is anxious... on my to be read list, Dr. Lorenz recommended it. Yes. It's, it's 
coming up quickly. My to be read list just keeps getting longer and longer and longer. It seems. Right? There's so many amazing books. Yes. Well, thank you again, Heather. Oh, Dr. Lorenz, you have your hand up? A comment? Yes. Heather, which book did you refer to? The Anxious Generation. Oh, yes. That's a must read for everyone in this room. And it includes us. Uh, obviously, it's about our it's about this current generation, but it certainly is a good reminder for me as an educator and a human, um, because you'll all you'll all read the book and say, oh, yeah, maybe I need to discipline myself a bit more to do a little bit less of this or to discipline yourself in different ways about how to use it. Uh, but that wasn't my question. Uh, actually. Now I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> per perhaps it will come back. Uh, I'll uh, I'll hold that thought for just a moment. Go on for oh, a walk. No, I know what it was. I know what it was. <laughs> so so Heather, you speak so eloquently as as Lindsay said about the inspiration for children and how it affects holistic learning for them. And I think that what we're really discussing here from a Sarasota University perspective is how important is nature to us as adults when we think about our roles in the BS and the master's and the eventual doctoral program, when we think about leadership, right? Mm -hmm. We're the ones sitting in the offices all day. We're the ones, uh, you know, uh, coaching all day and mm -hmm. we don't take time for ourselves. In fact, uh, despite the anxious generation, I found a setting on my watch that that I now have instructed it to tell me six times a day, how are you feeling right now? Just take a moment and it, it, you know, it pops up like, well, I see you're awake. Shall I start your day? And I'm like, yeah, make coffee. But the watch doesn't seem to do that. But <laughs> the point I'm making is that there you know, there's an app for everything as we well know it. But your work, as we relate it to the leadership values of the adults we work with, when we can offer those things to the adult leadership, then the leadership they offer to children is um, more inspirational. And to your so, point, Dr. Lorenz, I think you Lorenz, bring up I such think... an important point. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think it's Go harder. Ahead. I think it's harder for adults. I mean, I, my two things came to mind when you were talking, Dr. Lorenz. One is my phone tells me at the end of each week, how much time I spent on it uh, every day. And sometimes I'm like, Oh, really? That, okay. I've got to stop that. And then the next week comes right. Or my watch tells me every so often when I need to get up and move my body. And it, it seems so simple that we wouldn't need a reminder of that. But, but like you're saying, I, I often get so caught up in, and what I'm doing, well, let me just answer this email. Let me just do this. And then you turn around and the whole day is gone. Right. I think that being with children or being a child helps you be more present and listening to your body and doing what, what it needs. Then I think we sometimes are aware or do as adults. Precisely. And uh, I would just add that, um, you know, I, I used to love to watch the teachers who were out engaging with the students in recess, playing um, and getting that fresh air and really taking those deep breaths and moving their body, you know, helping run after the ball. Um, during kickball or on the track with the students, other things to consider incorporating into the day in a school uh, life would be uh, making sure that you take a walk outside um, at lunchtime, right? Taking that 30 minutes or even 15 minutes, whatever you can spare, and getting up and walking I'll never forget one of my uh, third graders came to me one day and she was so concerned. She said, Dr. Pollock, do you know that sitting too long is just as deadly 
as other unhealthy habits. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, my third grade student is giving me this uh, advice. And so I made it, you know, a point like Dr. Lorenz was sharing, um, you know, calendaring the time in my day to have that alarm bell go off. So I'd go outside and uh, be on the playground when the kids were there and, you know, interacting with students and teachers on the campus so that I was getting that vitamin D and that connection, not only to the people on my campus, but uh, to nature and, and modeling. As Dr. Uh, Summers points out, you can't give what you don't have. Mm -hmm. Modeling is the first teacher. So all that we can do to support one another. And Heather, thank you for being here tonight to support all of us. And thank you everyone for being here and participating tonight. I'd like to just remind everyone again that we are now enrolling in all 50 uh, great news NC Sarah. And I've just posted in the chat, uh, Ellen's email, info at sarasotauniversity.edu. If you are interested in applying for the bachelor's completion program or either of our master's of arts in Montessori education or Montessori leadership, um, all of our programs are MACD uh, accredited. We are a MACD accredited institution and um, so excited to be sharing all this great news with you this evening. Um, so again, thank you for being here tonight. Ellen's available by email. Please reach out to us if we can support you in uh, making your educational dreams come true for you or someone you know. Again, thank you, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you next month when Suzanne Newell will be back. Some of you remember Suzanne who presented um, on artificial intelligence or AI a couple of months ago. She will be and uh, we hope to see you then. Until then, have a wonderful Montessori experience and go out and make the world a better place. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>